Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hack Midtown. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we are going to be uh, efficient and respectful of your time, but while we're here, I hope everyone enjoys the air conditioning. Uh, it, is, uh, it is really nice, uh, temperature-wise. Um, we are very, very excited tonight to present to you two concepts, uh, two finalist concepts for the Second Straight Two-Way Project, which uh, grew out of the feedback that we received at our last meeting some months ago when we gathered at Startup Harrisburg. Um, as many of you know, this has been a, a, a long time uh, in, the, in, in the making uh, for Harrisburg, and uh, we've got a great team. I just want to introduce uh, some of the folks that you'll be hearing from in just a moment. Um, first, you'll be hearing from our city engineer, Mr. Wayne Martin, and uh, yes, he, he, will, he, will, uh, he will tell you. He will take you through a history of uh, basically uh, the background, uh, some of the background we presented at the last meeting, but boy, we're over capacity here. We know we have more people than at the last meeting, so we're going to go through a little bit of the history of how and why, and, um, uh, and he will also uh, review the, uh, the public engagement. We also have with us from Kittleson, Adam Vest. Adam, say hello. Uh, Kittleson, if you don't know, is the, uh, yes, well, let's give them, let's, we'll give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Kittleson is the company uh, that we have hired as a city to study the 83 widening uh, expansion concept. Well, uh, they're, uh, they're gonna be doing public engagement and, and, and surveying there, and they're working closely with PennDOT. They have uh, one of the most widely uh, respected traffic analysts in the country, and so they're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, traffic uh, analysis side of things. And then um, finally, you will hear from Will Wisemantle. Will, why, uh, raise your hand. Will is from Wallace Montgomery. Wallace Montgomery is uh, the design team that put together the final two concepts, has worked tirelessly on, uh, on, on uh, ever since, uh, since the last meeting and putting this together, and I can confirm that uh, all of the images, including the PowerPoint that you're gonna see tonight, all of that is up and live on the Vision Zero HBG website. So it's all under the rubric of Vision Zero, which of course is how can we make Harrisburg safer um, and uh, eliminate uh, traffic fatalities and serious accidents. So go to Vision Zero HBG if you wanna see more. Now a quick outline of how this room works there are four separate stations, and they are uh, arranged geographically south to north. So starting in the hallway is the southernmost section of 2nd Street, beginning at Forster. Then we go to the corner for the next section. We go over here to, uh, for a section number three, and we go in the back for section number four. So we've taken the, the concepts and the street and we've blown them up as big as we possibly could so you can really take a look at your own house or the own blocks that you're interested in seeing. If you want to see the whole thing sort of condensed smaller, it's there on the table in the center back and that has all of, uh, all of Second Street on it. But after we go through this uh, PowerPoint presentation, there is going to be time to go to each of these stations and to speak with, uh, with these gentlemen here and other representatives from Wallace Montgomery and the city to give your feedback. Now, we encourage you to write directly on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the images themselves. That's totally fine. We also have a comment form. And uh, the comment form is very simple. You can fill it out. There's a comment box centrally located there near the exit. We, we want your comments. As some of you may have read already today, um, there are a lot of similarities between the two different concepts, but the main difference is that one of them has a dedicated parking protected bike lane, and the other one has a center median and turn lane, a combination of pedestrian refuges and a turn lane. There are definite benefits to both. They are, uh, the city is genuinely interested in seeing if we can emerge from this meeting with a consensus. I don't know if there will be or won't be, but uh, we, are, we are interested in your feedback, okay? Um, and uh, with that, we are going to begin the PowerPoint. We're going to go about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then we'll go to the breakout sessions. 
And if you have questions, uh, we encourage you to ask them at the breakout session. You can ask them of me, the engineer, the design team, Kittleson, you can do all that. And we're going to stay as long as anybody wants to stay here and discuss, uh, discuss this concept. But let us give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history, uh, how we've gotten here. And then we're going to talk about the designs and hopefully teach you a little bit about how to how to read the maps and how to understand what exactly is being proposed. And we're going to begin with city engineer Wayne Martin. Wayne. Um, great. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be very brief. Uh, if you didn't make the last um, meeting, I did a very comprehensive um, background on the, uh, on the 2nd Street two-way conversion from when it was first converted, why it was converted. It's, it's very obvious at the time through internal and external correspondence that I inherited when I you know, was appointed city engineer. And, uh, and you can go through in, in, in that presentation and, and PowerPoint, which is on the Vision Zero um, HPG.org and also HB, uh, Vision Zero HPG.com. Uh, uh, or if you're a historian and would like to come to my office and look through some of these old documents, uh, please give me a call, schedule an appointment. But like I said, it was very apparent why it was changed. Uh, it was to get you know, traffic in and out of the city. Uh, with, without much thought about the livability, you know, of, of the corridor and, and the city as a whole. And so as other cities are trying to reverse that trend, um, Lancaster's doing it, Philadelphia's doing it, you know, here we are, City of Harrisburg, uh, doing it, and we're here today to make sure we do it right. So uh, just real quick, um, I just started this just in 2015, just a uh, brief, brief background. Uh, PennDOT did do their own study uh, in 2015, and determined that it was feasible. Uh, they did a, be, a very, uh, I don't want to say, it wasn't a comprehensive study, but part of that recommendation and that letter is um, you know, sort of in the image there on the side uh, from the district executive basically saying it's feasible, but you got to do a more comprehensive study. Well, that study has been completed. City Council did approve of that study. That was uh, done by the Walsh Montgomery team. Uh, that traffic study was headed up by the Kittleson group, and they're going to present on that to to today here. Uh, 2018, uh, PennDOT reiterated that as part of the 83 widening uh, project, so some of the thought process was um, on the 2nd Street two-way and, and, and how, you know, some traffic from the downtown would, would travel 83 instead of um, north to 81. Um, but we've heard that before, right? So when you go back through the study, you know, the, the bypass was built so that 2nd Street could go back to two-way. 7th Street was widening so that 2nd Street could go back to 2A. So, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, 2nd Street's, we're, we're happy to say, 2nd Street will be going 2A. Um, uh, 2019, um, we adopted a Vision Zero policy. Um, I hope everyone loves our Vision Zero policy. Um, we spent a lot of time on it. This certainly fits within the umbrella of a Vision Zero uh, program. Uh, which is why it's on our, our, our Vision Zero website and why we're so you know, excited about this particular project. It's not the only project in the city, but you know, for those of you who don't, uh, aren't familiar with the program, it's a commitment to end pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries by 2030. Uh, that's our commitment as a city, and we're going to do whatever it takes um, to get there. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry. The ICA approved the budget. So I did, I don't have the PowerPoint, but I have it in my notes. Uh, so I'll just th throw it out there. Here's the current construction budget. This is funded, you know, ready to go for the construction of this project. We have a multi-modal award of 2.892407. So essentially uh, $2.9 million ready to go. Uh, Impact Harrisburg award. This is a portion of the overall Impact Harris award. Uh, around 400000 is dedicated to this project. Uh, the ICA, what they approved was a general fund capital expenditure, which will go to city council uh, here soon. And that is a $1.6 million general fund commitment to the project. And then the city liquid fuel funds in the amount of uh, 821000 So that gives us a total construction budget currently of 5.7. Is that going to be enough? We're going to make it enough, right? We're going to design this project so that it's a $5.7 million project. Give you a little little idea of um, Third Street uh, is right around seven million. Now that goes all the way to Chestnut Street. That has a lot of bump outs and, and other uh, different traffic calming features that are uh, 
we're not going to implement on this. A lot of CRW stormwater connections uh, that, you know, if CRW is, is able to, we could see some of that, but um, probably definitely not to the extent we, we're seeing up on 3rd Street or right here on 3rd Street, actually. So without further ado, uh, Adam, Adam Vest. Thanks, Wayne. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me okay? So I'm curious, how many were at the last meeting? Maybe just a show of hands. Okay, so a good number. So you've seen what I'm going to present already, um, but obviously there are a lot of you here that have not seen that, so I'll go through this probably pretty quickly. And I would say afterwards, if you still have more detailed questions about some of the traffic analysis, just let me know. Um, Alexandra, uh, John Lee is somewhere. Um, so uh, there are other people here that can speak to some of the traffic analysis too if you have, if you have more questions. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that we were tasked with was obviously to understand what's happening on 2nd Street today um, as one way. That gives us a good sense of what's happening, but we also want to understand what happens if it is two-way. So that's looking at things like, well, what are the travel patterns today and how could they change? If people are using 2nd Street today, and you take some lanes away, what streets will they use? Um, so what other streets, you know, could they be diverted to? Um, and then also, where's the congestion at today? Where would we expect it to be congested in the future? You know, are they actual intersections or specific movements at intersections? Those are all the types of things that we looked at to understand what some of those impacts are. Um, again, if you want to talk about some of those spe uh, specific things, then um, I can do that afterwards. Um, so we understand that for at least a couple hours of the day, you know, let's say four to six, that traffic won't be able to fit on Second Street anymore. I think everyone, I mean, I think everyone's probably aware of that. Um, so we need to understand <clears throat> how we can mitigate those issues. Um, we don't just say, well, it's going to go somewhere, it'll be okay. We want to understand what those impacts are and if we need to, how we actually fix them. So we did a very comprehensive study um, in this area, um, from Forster all the way up to Division, from Front all the way to 7th Street. We looked at every signalized intersection, as well as some unsignalized intersections as well. So that's actually going out and collecting traffic data, and then doing analysis for existing conditions and also future conditions to really understand what some of these impacts are. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone here probably knows what the major travel trends are, right? In the morning, Everyone's on Front Street, and they're coming into the city. In the afternoon, Second Street is how people leave the city. And McClay actually carries a lot of traffic, too, because it allows people to go across the railroad tracks to the east as well. Um, so again, pretty straightforward. You know, everyone's coming into the, the downtown to work, and they do it on these two streets, for the most part, if they come from the north. So I think this, these graphs are really interesting. So some of you saw this the last time. So, these three graphs represent locations where we collected um, a lot of data to understand the volumes and the speeds. Each of these bars that you see represent an hour of the day. The larger, the taller the bar, the more traffic volume that you would have. Um, so that represents the full 24 hours of the day. On the left, that's um, south of Schuylkill, so that's to the north. The one in the middle is somewhat in the center part of the corridor. And the one at the bottom uh, with some of the higher bars is what you see closer to Forrester Street. So, show of hands, how many people know the speed limit on 2nd Street? What is it? 25. 25, all right. So, um, the, you'll have to squint to see this, but the blue, the little blue marks you see there at the bottom, those are people that are driving at or below the speed limit. <laughs> to the north, it's 93% of people are exceeding the speed limit. And I think everyone here knows why that's happening, right? It's, it's an overbuilt street. There are a couple hours of the day that it carries a lot of traffic, but there are also 22 hours of the day where it's not. And that results in some really high speeds. Um, as you get closer to downtown, if you look at the ones over on the right, the blue is a little bigger, right? You have more traffic, therefore it slows things down a little bit. But that's one of the real reasons that we're looking at this project. Uh, we want to figure out ways to calm traffic. It's, for the most part, a residential street. You get to the bottom or the southern part, it's, you know, have some more commercial activity. But a lot of people are living on this street, um, and it's not very livable if 93% of the people are, are actually not driving the speed limit. <clears throat> so, for the most part, we know that the intersections in the area, with exception of a couple um, or a few, 
are actually operating pretty well from a traffic standpoint. That doesn't mean that you don't have uh, congestion at McClay for specific movements or that the left turn from Forrester on the second isn't backed up, you know, for a couple hours of the day. But overall, intersections, if you look at them, you know, as, as a whole, um, are actually doing pretty well. Um, we, we usually measure this in terms of seconds of delay per person, so you have like an average delay. And for the most part, the intersections you see 20 to 35 seconds of delay during, let's say, on 2nd Street, mainly during the PM peak period, so somewhere between 4 and 6. Um, I think the biggest issue that I've already mentioned is what we're calling traffic diversion. That is, from 4 to 6, where do those people go? Um, and our analysis shows that they can, they're going in a number of different places. Um, the, obviously, the closest street is 3rd Street, um, so we think some will use 3rd Street. Um, and we had a discussion uh, with a few people <laughs> the last time about, well, they're actually doing a lot of traffic calming stuff on 3rd Street now, too. So does that make sense that people would actually want to do that? And I would say that, you know, some people may, but some people may want to go someplace else. Um, our models also show that some will use 6th and 7th. Um, so that's farther away from 2nd. Um, and our analysis takes into account what happens on those streets. And for the most part, we think it should be okay. Um, so I'm curious, how many people here that live in this area actually work west of the river? So I would say maybe 10 people. So I bring that up because that means you're coming across the bridge and then you're probably maybe making that left on the second street, right? That's kind of your, your big movement. But if you look at this collectively, that's a pretty small percentage. I bring that up because over 30% of the traffic on second street from four to six is making that left turn which means they're coming from across the bridge, which means they're not even most likely living in this area. Um, some are, as we just talked about, um, but a lot of people are using Second Street as just a cut through, right? It's easier for some people to actually cross the river, go up Second, and then get to the Beltway in that way, as opposed to staying west of the river where it's more congested. Uh, but again, there's a large percentage of people that do that movement, which the only reason you would do that, the only place you can originate is from across the river. But I think that's kind of an important consideration when we're talking about these types of improvements. Um, so again, that's just a quick overview of some of the work that we've been doing. I can ask or address any questions you have after this. Um, but uh, Wayne's going to talk a bit more about what we heard at the last meeting and what we've heard through some of the surveys and how that's informed um, some of the things that we're showing you today. Thank you. So obviously our purpose here tonight is to, uh, I'm going to tell you what you've told us uh, or what your neighbors told us, and it's your opportunity to tell us if we got it right or we got it wrong or we forgot something or missed something. Uh, so some of you went ahead and designed the street for us. I think that was one of our uh, planning commission members. So thank you. That, that made it uh, relatively easy. Um, so these were the things that were most important, and uh, not, not in this particular order, but we do have a slide that shows the particular order. Uh, parking, uh, everyone was united that they didn't want to lose parking. Uh, bicycle amenities, split, it was about 50-50, I think. Uh, speed reduction, overwhelming uh, number of people felt that speed reduction was important. Uh, crosswalk improvements, crosswalks in, at all, <laughs> uh, median uh, some some like the a center median with um, you know vegetation and, and which is also a traffic calming feature uh, and some felt that perhaps that would be a maintenance um, maintenance headache for somebody and and would probably um, make the neighborhood look unsightly if if not properly kept which is certainly a true uh, statement and comment uh, some like the modern day roundabouts uh, some maybe not so sure I guess they're sort of new to the area. And um, deliveries, of course, uh, business was, uh, was critical, right? Maintaining existing businesses, uh, the more retail, heavy retail corridor is, especially in the south, uh, the more deliveries you have, uh, very important to those businesses. Um, so here, uh, here's the survey respondents. Um, me. Actually, I'm going to point this way for a moment. Uh, we have the residents in blue, resident respondents in blue. Residents in red. Um, again, it's uh, you know pretty pretty even, but certainly residents had a little bit different take on the corridor than, than commuters would. Uh, 
These slides are all online if you want to dive into the details. Um, you know, some things were interesting. I guess that's a little bit shady, but you know, overwhelming support uh, for safety improvements. Uh, then we also broke down the data that was uh, provided to us in, into four more segments. Uh, thanks to the panel group for, for uh, being represented here pretty well. So that was uh, you know, the majority of the respondents for the south and the south, but uh, certainly up north. But maybe there's just less residents up there too. Right? And we broke down all the desired changes. But again, it's uh, pretty consistent. You know, safety, uh, parking. Traffic. <clears throat> so parking, uh, both uh, both residents, non-residents uh, commented on, on the importance of parking. And, uh, you know, that's basically it. There was nothing particularly unique about the survey results. It's about what we anticipated. Um, but as you see into the concepts, you can see how uh, each one of those, uh, you know, whether it's parking, whether it's uh, bicycle minis, each one of those um, considerations were, were considered in the uh, concepts that were developed. And if uh, they weren't considered to the extent you feel necessary, then certainly that's why we're here today. Uh, that's why the comment cards are there. That's why we have all the roll-up maps. So without further ado, uh, Will Weissman will go through all those concepts for you. Thank you, Wayne. So taking into uh, the account of all the public input that we received from both the meeting and uh, the online poll, uh, we went through a lot of the typicals that everyone had proposed uh, in the workshop session. A lot of them, unfortunately, don't fit with the width of the road that we currently have and would require widening the road, which, uh, as was alluded to before, we do have a limited budget with this project. So the key is to fit within the existing footprint curb to curb as much as possible with this. So uh, taking that into account, all the public feedback, and really focusing on some of the key uh, safety improvements that came out of the public feedback, we developed the two concepts, which uh, a lot of you have already seen out, and we'll have more opportunity to talk about um, in greater detail at the breakout sessions. Uh, the first concept here, concept one, is uh, very similar to uh, the current configuration of uh, the road. Instead of it being uh, three lanes heading northbound, though, it would be converted to one southbound lane and a center turn lane. Uh, this allows opportunity for uh, improved uh, turning movements at some of the intersections, uh, where if there was just one lane in each direction, you would only be, uh, there w might be some delay with vehicles uh, trying to turn left with the through movements. Uh, I'll go into uh, basically a standard unsignalized intersection that we would have uh, on the corridor with this concept. Uh, because a lot of the uh, cross streets are one way, uh, there's only the need for a left turn lane on one side of the intersection. So that allows us to create a uh, pedestrian refuge island in the uh, middle of the road to create a two-stage pedestrian crossing. A uh, lot of concerns we heard from uh, the public at the first public meeting uh, was that uh, they um, liked the configuration now of being able to look one way when they're crossing the street and not having to look for cars coming both way. What, uh, by providing this refuge island, you create a two-stage crossing, so a pedestrian only has to look one direction at a time while they're crossing uh, 2nd Street. Um, as uh, was also talked about earlier, we're not looking at doing uh, bull bouts that are being constructed currently on third streets, mostly due to uh, construction uh, funding. So uh, in order to shorten the pedestrian crossings, we would put um, proposed pavement markings and uh, flexible post delineators. Uh, that would create with the median a uh, channelizing effect that would uh, slow vehicles down as they're approaching the intersection. So uh, here, here's, um, and directly tying into uh, the public feedback with some of the uh, improvements that this would provide. Uh, you know, currently a lot of the cross streets don't have uh, crosswalks. Uh, this would also afford the opportunity for landscaping in the median. Uh, the length of the island we're showing right now is just an early uh, concept, uh, depending on overall construction funding and how things come in as we get into further detailed design. There may be the opportunity to lengthen this median um, island from what it's shown right now, but uh, 
it would not extend for the entire length of uh, the corridor given the uh, construction budget. Um, this also, as I mentioned, allows left turn lanes, but also a center turn lane. So uh, residents who uh, want to access a driveway would be able to access from um, either heading northbound or southbound and uh, utilize the center turn lane to either pull in or pull out of their uh, driveway. Um, additional um, improvements that this corridor would have or this concept would have in addition um, that were not directly related to the uh, public involvement would be uh, the dedicated left turns as I already discussed, uh, the center turn lane and also uh, we would because of the slower speeds we would be able to provide uh, what are called sharrows which allow for uh, shared uh, bike and motor vehicle uh, um, navigation on the road. So here's a, a typical uh, unsignalized uh, intersection that you have on 2nd Street right now. Um, you know, uh, there's not a clearly defined crossing for pedestrians wishing to travel from one side of 2nd Street to the other. And uh, very long crossing distance and, um, um, you know, the high rates of speed that we're all accustomed to today. And um, so this is a rendering of what uh, Concept 1 would look like. As I discussed, you'd have... Uh, painted bulb outs on the corners that would kind of create a channelizing effect to uh, shorten the pedestrian crossing and also uh, the median island for uh, on one side of the intersection to provide that uh, pedestrian um, safety spot. Here's the same intersection uh, from a slightly different vantage point. And here's a look at um, a preview of uh, the corridor concepts that are out on the tables around us uh, this evening, um, showing uh, block by block we want to provide uh, the amount of parking that would potentially be lost, and we'll have more on that in discussion in a little bit. Um, but uh, you know how the intersections configure with each other, with the center turn lanes, the left turn lanes, and the uh, opportunity for uh, uh, improvements at some of the current signalized intersections. Concept 2 uh, takes a little bit of a different approach to the road from its current configuration. Again, keeping curbs in the same spot and using the existing road footprint that we have. Uh, it would provide a uh, still one through lane in both northbound and southbound direction, but there would not be the left turn lane and therefore not have the uh, pedestrian refuge option. In its place, though, would be a parking protected bike lane that would run on the northbound side of the street. Uh, bike lane would be uh, five feet in width, and there would be a three-foot buffer between um, uh, the bike lane and park vehicles that would allow for uh, residents who are parking to open their doors and not have the uh, conflict that happens on some bike lanes. So again, looking at our standard unsignalized intersection, um, even though we don't have the pedestrian refuge, because it's only two lanes, uh, the actual space that a uh, pedestrian actually has to cross when they're crossing 2nd uh, Street is uh, 22 feet. Uh, so um, tying in with the uh, desired improvements that came out of the uh, public workshop and the poll, uh, we would uh, improve by providing additional crosswalks with the high visibility, the ADA improvements, uh, pavement markings with the, the flex posts. Um, we also, uh, and I failed to mention with the first one, are looking at quarter wide lighting improvements uh, since that was also a uh, um, high uh, feedback on that. Um, additional improvements, uh, we would provide a similar shared lane in the southbound uh, direction. Um, but this configuration also would configure with the uh, southbound bike lane on Front Street. And again, to show a rendering, the uh, same location that we uh, saw previous with the very wide pedestrian crossing, and then the uh, two-lane configuration with, um, you know, with the channelizing effect in this alternative gained with pavement markings and uh, flexible post delineators. Uh, 
um, at the uh, intersection points to create a little bit of uh, visibility for motorists and um, um, to let it be known that there's a bike lane, we'd be looking at uh, using uh, green paint uh, to accentuate the uh, bike lane in those locations. And uh, similar uh, view to the last one, uh, just showing an overall, a small section of the corridor of how the intersections configure with each other, uh, parking loss uh, that is accompanied with this uh, configuration as well. So in this next slide, uh, We'll look at some of the uh, comparisons um, that came in from the uh, public input and um, how the two concepts uh, address both of those in their own ways. Uh, the uh, crosswalks are both improved uh, through providing um, ADA compliant curb ramps, pavement markings with uh, piano key style, and also shortening the overall pedestrian crossings um, with the uh, pedestrian median refuge in concept one and the um, um, two lanes to cross in uh, concept two. Both options will provide a speed reduction through uh, the nar um, narrow lane effect uh, that I talked about with channelizing at the intersections, as well as some other uh, vertical uh, configurations that I'll uh, get into in a little more detail when we talk about the, uh, some of the intersection options. Um, both options uh, do have a parking reduction, and uh, I have a slide on that in a little bit. Um, the, uh, as far as trees and landscaping, which was another uh, request that a lot of uh, folks had, uh, Concept 1 does provide a little bit more with landscaping with the median islands, but there is the opportunity in Concept 2 to provide landscaping at some of the uh, proposed mini roundabouts and other intersection treatments that we uh, talked about, or we'll talk about. Um, also, similarly, uh, we'll have medians that were requested in concept one but not provided in concept two. And really, that's the two differences, or the next two items on this list between medians and bike lanes. Concept one provides the medians that were requested, concept two provides the bike lanes. And uh, there just isn't the road footprint with trying to maintain parking to really provide uh, that's both. That's the most important part, sir. I'm sorry. I live there in that section where we're going from five spots to two. And we keep allowing people to take these single family homes <coughs> and make more apartments. And no one has just one car anymore. And you just said yourself that parking is the number one thing. And you just said now that, well, sorry, parking's a casualty to this. That is not acceptable to the people that live there, man. There was a lot of feedback, and by and far the largest request that we heard was for safety improvements on the corridor from the uh, public poll that was taken. Speed reduction, parking was up there, and we understand that, um, and we're trying to today work with everyone, and that's why we're having the breakout sessions to kind of go through, to talk about your section in particular. I'll gladly talk with you after this. Uh, but the everyone board, so here, I think, has that concern. I don't own a car. Okay. Yep. Next slide. So, speaking of parking, there are really three uh, three reasons parking will be lost on this. And the first reason um, happens regardless of whether the two-way conversion on 2nd Street takes place or not. And that's uh, with regards to resurfacing the road. By federal law standards with ADA requirements, if um, a jurisdiction like the city of Harrisburg has to resurface uh, the road, uh, they're required to put in uh, ADA compliant curb ramps. With the curb ramps come crosswalks. And with those crosswalks, uh, state law requires that a parking space has to be 20 feet from a crosswalk. So a lot of uh, the cross streets that are unsignalized right now do not have crosswalks. And people, you know, as you all know, park very close to the intersections. Um, 
not only is that an issue from sight distance at those intersections, but it presents a pedestrian safety issue for people who do try to cross there. And um, tying in with the Vision Zero and the goal to eliminate pedestrian fatalities, um, minimizing the parking at the unsignalized intersections um, is a key to uh, achieve uh, that goal. Um, driveway sight distance also is another spot we looked at closely. Right now, when, when people pull out of their driveways, they only have to look for traffic going one way. After the conversion takes place, there will be traffic going both ways. So there's more of a delay in your decision time with pulling out of a driveway when you have to look both to your left and to your right to um, make that determination. So there is some elimination of parking ad um, adjacent to uh, driveways. And this happened. Can you please address, while you're on this parking issue, uh, the following areas? Those of us who utilize fuel oil, have fuel trucks that come, they're going to stop the traffic in order to deliver the oil. Number two, AAA comes, or some other equivalent, to pick up a vehicle that needs to be towed. What happens then? Okay. Uh, what about the, uh, the vehicles that are delivering the uh, cores or what have you? Uh, in addition to that, in addition to that, how about the... Some of your questions will be answered in the presentation. How about not, the bed and breakfast that are illegally being operated, which contribute three, four, and five additional vehicles to the community? Sit down. Sit down. Now, it's a big problem. It is. It's going to be it's a big problem. later. Let it finish. I don't want to hear what the solutions are. Be patient. Sorry. Um, the, the last uh, key point with the number of uh, legally identified parking spaces that would cause a reduction is uh, the bike lanes uh, with the parking, con um, parking protected configuration. Uh, we wanted to provide enough sight distance so if a vehicle is turning right um, onto a side street where there is a uh, bike lane directly adjacent to it that they, the, both the motor vehicle and the biker have enough, enough uh, sight distance to recognize each other and one or the other uh, to uh, slow down. One of the public inputs we received was uh, um, the idea of using uh, either angle in or uh, back and angle parking on the corridor. Uh, what we found with the uh, either providing pedestrian refuges or the left turns is that uh, providing this would um, basically uh, push the parking towards the middle of the block. Uh, you know, not only would some residents not have parking near their homes right now, but uh, even on the other side of the street on southbound in this example, uh, there would not be uh, uh, parking. So we looked at this configuration very briefly, but realized uh, given the width of the road that uh, the, there would be even a greater parking reduction with angle and parking. So this is um, an overall look at the parking, um, you know, over about a two-mile corridor. Uh, you know, the key takeaway from this is uh, the percentage would be about 11 or 13 percent reduction in parking. <coughs> and uh, again, you know, we have it broken out block by block on the uh, table boards all, all around the room and out in the hallway. So, uh, you know, we uh, welcome the opportunity to discuss it further and other concerns. Uh, pertaining to that. Um, as far as the signalized intersections, uh, we looked at a couple of uh, uh, various options as listed here. Uh, some of these signals uh, would need to maintain and are re still required. We, uh, for intersections that no longer need a signal based off of the traffic analysis, uh, we looked at quite a few traffic calming measures, um, including mini roundabouts, four-way stop, two-way stop, uh, raised intersections which would be a concrete raised intersection similar to what's around the Capitol complex that was installed a couple of years ago, raised crosswalks, as well as um, um, pedestrian uh, rapid flashing beacons. So just a quick overview of uh, each one of the signals that's currently on the corridor. Um, at Forrester Street, uh, the signal would be, 
remain and need to be converted to uh, allow the two-way uh, traffic configuration. For Beck Street, that is one where the signal can be removed and our current concept is uh, um, proposing a mini roundabout. Uh, this is just uh, one idea for what could be um, used at this intersection and uh, something that can be um, discussed further. Uh, Riley Street again, uh, traffic analysis shows that the signal is no longer needed after the conversion and a mini roundabout can be installed here. Um, same again with Kelker. McClay then becomes the uh, first street uh, as you go north of Forrester that uh, will still uh, need a signal in order to operate. And that's one of the keys with uh, looking at some of these innovative intersections such as a mini roundabout between the two signals. You get a rather long corridor without a uh, signal to um, provide uh, you know, greater traffic calming effects. Uh, Emerald Street, the uh, signal can be um, removed and uh, our analysis shows that a uh, uh, mini roundabout would not be required here. Uh, it's not to say that it couldn't be installed, but uh, um, it, it, could, it can operate uh, with a, uh, a simply a stop sign. Um, same with Radnor. And then um, Division Street, again, would be uh, maintained as a signal and converted for uh, two-way operations. When you say stop sign, do you mean a stop sign on Second Street? No, it would be on the Cross Street. Okay. Yeah, we're not currently proposing any four-way uh, stops on Second Street. Oh, so here's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Verbeck Street and um, how it could potentially look with the mini roundabout configuration. The central island of the mini roundabout in this uh, would be designed to be fully mountable. It would be only about three inches above uh, the road and would allow for uh, delivery vehicles, fire trucks, um, to still make left turns off of 2nd Street onto Verbeck or vice versa. So um, going briefly into the um, schedule moving forward uh, with the project, um, the city hopes to make an alternative selection in uh, August, uh, at which point our design team will move ahead with um, pl preliminary design through this year. We'll enter uh, final design into early next year, concluding in around March. Uh, then we'll go through the advertisement process of uh, the city selecting a contractor to bid and uh, be awarded the work. Uh, construction then would begin in uh, May of uh, next year. Uh, we, the final, the actual construction sequence hasn't been developed at this point, but we anticipate most of the work that you would see during 2020 would be reconstruction of curb ramps, uh, lighting upgrades, inlet upgrades, uh, that kind of work. As far as the final resurfacing of the road, pavement markings, and the ultimate configure, uh, conversion to two-way operations, we anticipate that to be in 2021. So um, with that, we're going to go into uh, the breakout sessions. Uh, you know, as uh, the mayor discussed earlier, uh, we encourage you to write on the plans. We're going to go through all the comments, whether on the plans or um, filled out on a comment form. We also have an email address that you can send um, comments to. And um, I'll leave uh, this up. It's a map of the corridor with the uh, four tables that we have set up. Uh, table one is out in the hallway, right by the entrance that you came in. Uh, table two is over in that corner there. Um, table three is uh, in this corner, and then table four is also out in the hallway. Thank you.